I'll never forget, he sent me an email a couple years ago with that song, and he said, this is the song of my life, and one day I'll sing it. And I asked him to sing it this week, and I had no idea when I asked him how appropriate it would be for what God has laid on my heart today. God has been with us through all of it. We began this sermon series a few weeks ago, When I Lay My Isaac Down, Unshakable Faith in Unthinkable Circumstances, by first discovering the power of unthinkable circumstances. Megan encouraged us to do three things. you got to love a recruit. <laughs> Choose to believe that God will surely come to help us. And choose to see past our pain to see that God is good. And thirdly, to choose to have faith that God's goodness and God's love can accommodate our honesty, our questions, and our doubts. And then last week, we discovered the power of relinquishment. Craig Lewis painted an incredible picture of both Abraham and Isaac both laying down their wheels and choosing to trust God's plan for them. Their faith held them in the midst of really difficult, trying times. And today we are here to uncover the power of heartache. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, God, that in the midst of all of the things that you've brought us through, we trust, God, that you are able and willing to help us. We thank you, God, that we come broken, that you're there to mend us and put the pieces back together again. So God, tear by tear, shore us up again to be your work and your, in your world. And God, we promise in the end to give you all the glory. In the mighty, matchless, marvelous name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Has your heart ever been broken? Just Friday night, as I watched that Pulse documentary on CNN, I was heartbroken all over again for those who lost their lives and for the families who lost their loved ones. As if I was hearing this story for the very first time, the tears just kept coming. At the first commercial break, I was wiping and wiping tears. Heartache starts in your gut, right? And it's this deep, deep pain that is almost unexplainable. Words can't and won't do it justice. There's nothing else that hurts like heartache. That pain travels up your spine and a sharp twinge pierces your heart and it moves up your neck, involuntarily causing your lip to quiver. And then tears form in the corner of your eyes. And at first your lids catch those tears and they rest on the brim until the lids are overwhelmed and then the floodgates come crashing down and the tears begin to flow and flow and flow. As a self-professed crying professional, <laughs> hey, we've all got to be good at something and that's not something, but it's more really like this, <laughs> dressed up and boohooing all at the same time, a crying professional. I knew I should have bought stocking Kleenex years ago, I would be set for life. But in all of this crying and tear flow and nose wiping <laughs> times, I've learned three things about tears. And I want to share those with you today. Number one, tears are valuable. Secondly, tears are beneficial. And thirdly, tears are a language God understands. We begin with tears are valuable. We collect things that we value, right? How many of you had a coin collection or a stamp collection, a hat collection or a doll collection? Anybody have those things? All right. I told first service all the nerds raised their hands. Praise God. <laughs> and I'm right there with you, right? Did any of y'all have a bug collection? No. Please don't say anybody had a bug collection. That's a whole different thing. Oh, he had a bug collection. Oh, goodness. Okay. I'm going to pray for y'all especially today. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the psalmist understood full well that God deemed his tears valuable because David penned in Psalm 56, which served as our scripture lesson for this morning, that God collected his tears in a bottle. If you've seen the movie The Shack, and if you haven't, you must. Um, if you remember in the movie how Spirit Saryu collected the many tears that Mac, the main character, cried for his daughter whom he had tragically 
lost. And each time tears would fall, she would walk over and collect those tears in this vial. And later she would use that same vial to water the garden that they had planted together and where they had chosen a spot to bury his child. And then the plants begin to grow. Beauty, you see, from ashes. Growth comes through tears. Something to think about. Our contemporary word revealed the closest <laughs> communion with God comes through the sacrament of tears. Just as grapes are crushed to make wine and grain to make bread, so the elements of the sacrament of tears come from the crushing experiences of life. The psalmist concurs again in Psalm 34. David declared, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Know that God values those tears that form because of our great sorrow or the tremendous loss. And then God collects them and waters our lives with those tears, causing things to bloom even following the most difficult of circumstances. That's the first thing I know about tears. I know my garden is quite full of many, many flowers, but I trust that in those times of tears that form, that God's spirit overflows the most. Because you see, when you become a blubbering idiot, it's nothing but God, because who would do this on their own? This is proof that God will use anybody and some good mascara along the way. <laughs> Praise God for MAC products. <laughs> the second thing I propose is something that I've learned over the years, and it took me a long time to, to, to realize this, but tears are beneficial. Kind of like kale and cauliflower, blueberries and broccoli. It's not superfood, but it is soul food, and not soul food as in collards and cornbread. But research has proven that tears are our body's release valve for stress, for sadness, for grief, anxiety, and frustration. One researcher submits that tears have healing properties, and he's lifted, listed seven that tell us what healing properties there are in tears. First of all, he said tears help us to see as they lubricate our eyeballs and prevent dehydration. I should never need water again. <laughs> tears kill bacteria as they contain an enzyme which functions as an antiseptic. They also remove toxins that build up courtesy of stress. And then he says crying can elevate our mood by reducing the manganese levels that cause stress and anxiety in our lives. And then he said, fifthly, that crying lowers stress as tears are like perspiration in that in both exercising and crying, they both reduce stress. Note, he said, that not crying can increase stress. So those of you who think you can't cry, let those tears flow. You're holding back. Sixthly, tears build community. They foster communication by promoting intimacy, and they also foster community. Tears release feelings. We accumulate conflicts and resentments. And by crying, he said, we let the devil out. Crying is cathartic. So when we find those insights helpful, I'm grateful that I ought to be a healthy somebody with all that understanding. <laughs> but I don't know about you, but I've learned more through the difficult times in my life than any of the easy times of my life. I've grown more as a person having survived heartache and enduring trial. I can't think of a time when I have, have matured by simply living a life of ease and comfort. It's what I want, but I never have ever grown or learned something new or found some incredible insight when I sit back and get everything I want when I want it and things are going just so smoothly. It's easy to wish for those things, but what's the point? Where is the growth in all of that? Is that why we're here? Do we come to be coddled and comforted here in this place? Or do we come to be challenged and deepened? My prayer is that you come to get deeper with God. You see, we talked on, on, on Wednesday night in, in spiritual transformation and in the midst of talking about the power of heartache, one woman stood up and said, I'm so thankful that this church makes me go deep. Y'all, she should have handed me a million dollars. My job is done when people are willing to go deep. That's why we're here, saints. 
few weeks ago. I was struggling. Our numbers were down, and commitment seems off. Nobody seems to want to, to, to do much. And, and I began questioning God. And this happens about 50 times a day. But on this week, it happened like 100 times a day. But that particular time, I had someone come to me and say, for the first time in 50-some years, I was able to come to this church and finally be myself. <laughs> Look what God can do. I got the message loudly and clearly. While others may think we're too far out there because it makes them uncomfortable when we go out and we are the community, when we take the doors off the church and not slam them and lock them and, and keep us all safe in this room, I trust that we are called to be community. Community is our middle name, in fact. It's not comfort. It's Metropolitan Community Church on purpose. We are called into community. And we are called not to be comfortable people, but we're called to go out and be that community in the world. Do you realize that while that Pulse documentary was airing on CNN, I got messages from all over the world, literally, of people thanking me, of, of saying I'm so thankful now that my son realizes there's a place that he can go and that, and that God loves him just as he is. Do you realize what good news a mother found in Germany because of CNN and Pulse? Did that happen because of comfort? Absolutely not. That a woman says, I'm so thankful for your testimony because you see, I just never really thought being gay was wrong, but I didn't know anybody until my brother came out. Look what God can do, saints. But it's never happened when we're comfortable. Had Pulse not happened, would CNN ever come to Joy Metropolitan Community Church? Absolutely not. People need to know God loves them. And they won't know when they're comfortable. Tears are beneficial in my life. As much as I've fought them, I know that God has used tears to bring healing and help and hope to a whole lot of people. And as much as I hate it, I'm going to keep crying for Jesus because I realize that this is the way people find the hope that I've found. Tears are beneficial. Lastly, I've learned that tears are a language God understands. You see, in the 11th chapter of John's gospel, we read that Jesus' good friend Lazarus had taken ill, and his sisters Mary and Martha had called on Jesus. He was away, and they sent word to him for him to come there to help, and Jesus didn't come back right away. But when he did return, Lazarus had been dead for four days by now and was entombed by that time that Jesus got to Bethany. Martha met Jesus as he was nearing the house, and she expressed her concern that Jesus had not gotten there sooner. And then when Jesus got even closer to where the people gathered, Mary expressed the same type of distress. She said, Lord, if you'd been here, our brother wouldn't be in this predicament. Jesus, then in verse 33, John tells us that Jesus sees Mary weeping and the Jews who had gathered there with her also weeping. And John recorded, Jesus was deeply disturbed in spirit and deep, greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And then Jesus asked them to show him where they had laid Lazarus. And when they brought Jesus to where Lazarus was in the tomb, John writes, Jesus began to weep. Jesus felt the sorrow for his friends and knew the depth of the friendship with Lazarus. And therefore, Jesus wept. The writer of Hebrews says it best, we do not have a high priest who is not unable to sympathize with us. Tears are a language God understands. Jesus has been where we are and he's felt our pain and knows what it's like to suffer. Picture him in the Garden of Gethsemane, moments before he would be arrested and tried and crucified. Jesus was struggling and I imagine when those sweat drops of blood were happening, tears were were also flowing. And yet amazingly, out of that very weekend, out of the greatest heartache of all, the sky turned dark on Friday afternoon. And I believe this is a picture of God's personal grief. And then we see the power of heartache and how something incredibly tragic can bring about the most incredible good. You see, saints, without Fridays, 
Sundays never come. Amazing things can happen in three days. Earth's saddest day and the gladdest day were just three days apart. And so it is my prayer that we're in the midst of our Fridays and when we are in the midst of times that make no sense and we don't understand why 49 people, 50 and younger, had to pass away because someone couldn't love themselves. We understand that sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of Fridays, but I thank God that there are benefits in suffering and that God brings about ultimate good from incredible tragedy. And we can thank God that even though Friday's here, like they used to say, Sunday's always coming. And I'm grateful for a time and a place where we can give thanks to a God who is nearest to us when we're in the midst of struggle. Sometimes when you can't see God, that's how God, that's, that's how close God is to us. And it is my prayer that we find the benefit of tears and we see the power in heartache. It changes things. May it change us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.